Hello and warm welcome to our session on democratizing AI with digital public goods. Uh, my name is Leah Gimpel. I'm with the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And together with my colleague from the German Development Corporation project, GIZ Fair Forward, I'm going to talk for the next 30 minutes uh, with you about DPGs and its impact on the global majority world. So when it comes to AI democratization, um, there's really one number that stands out, and that is 70%. 70% of the sustainable development goals rely on digital solutions if we are still want to achieve them. So they are due 2030. So we have around five and a half years left. Um, but we are not on track. So we need to find actually uh, means to uh, improve the attainment of the SDGs and positively impact people's livelihoods by us. And of course, when it comes to the 70%, AI systems can play a fundamental part. If they are available to people, if they can be developed locally, if they benefit communities, and if they are governed inclusively. So that is really the precondition because AI systems, in a way, as they are currently developed, they don't serve global majority countries, at least in, in large parts. So we need to think differently about AI systems development for these uh, geographies. And to democratize AI in all its facets, so meaning the use, the development capacities, the benefits, but also governance, we need digital public goods. So they are really essential. What are digital public goods? Um, that's a definition that originates from the United Nations Secretary General um, from 2019. Um, he basically urged back then everyone, so the private sector, governments, as well as civil society to cooperate and uh, undertake concerted global efforts to further digital public goods, meaning open source software, open AI models, open data, open standards, and open content that uh, adhere to applicable laws um, that do no harm by design and that help attain these sustainable development goals. So really in a nutshell, digital public goods are open AI systems and then a few other categories as well, but we're <laughs> gonna talk about AI. Uh, today. And just quickly, as a Digital Public Goods Alliance, uh, we support the investment in discoverability of and use of digital public goods. So that's really the main pur purpose of the organization I'm working for. So digital public goods, again, advance the sustainable development goals. They are open source and they do no harm. Uh, at the DPGA, we say they are basically open source plus plus if you want, because there's a level on top of the open source. Uh, definition of them. And as a DPGA, we operationalize this also. So we are the custodian of the DPG standard. Um, that's a set of nine indicators by which we vet products. So developers can submit their product to the DPGA and we have a tech team that then goes through these nine indicators and sees how the product fulfills uh, the indicators. And if you adhere to all of these nine indicators, you are uh, recognized as a digital public good and you're on a public registry and we also help promote you um, and connect you to opportunities. Um, when it comes to AI, um, we really see there the opportunity to help digital self-determination of people, right? And in a bit more concrete, AI DPGs are fundamental to increase access to powerful technologies, and developer resources, especially for those that don't have it. So open source AI basically is a fundamental tool to enable access. They empower the development of solutions for local ambitions and needs to, but also address market failure. So for areas and where big tech is not active, open source AI and the IDPGs actually play a fundamental role because then local developers can actually uh, go and fill this gap. And of course, they also create economic opportunities in uh, global majority countries. And apart from that, of course, it's about representation, so language diversity, cultural diversity, and alignment with different value systems. And open source AI and AI DPGs also help uh, to well, avoid the entrenchment of existing power imbalances because you strengthen other ecosystems uh, by us as well. So, I think we all know open source currently is not well defined. I mean, we've discussed this extensively. Um, just uh, in parallel to this session, there is a session on the state of open source AI and its definition. So it's a contested field. And there's a lot of open washing and confusion around the term. Some call it open access, open weight, open source. 
But what it actually means is quite unclear, and the open source initiative is undertaking this process to defining open source AI currently, um, where they, I mean, they build on the four freedoms of open source, of course, in doing so. And as a Digital Public Goods Alliance, we are kind of dependent on what OSI is doing because DPGs are open source, so whatever OSI is developing in this multi-stakeholder process, that is also going to be core of how we look at AI, uh, digital public goods, so to say. And what we are doing uh, in parallel to the open source initiatives process of defining open source AI is actually updating our DPG standard because it was developed back in 2019 when generative AI was not yet at the point where it is currently. And um, we want to update it to better yeah, vet products that actually um, yeah, use uh, AI models in it. And doing so means also for us the ambition to become the first open standard for responsible open source AI. Because as I said, for us, DPGs are open source plus plus, so there's this level of responsibility and purpose uh, on top of the open source definition. And what we are doing uh, is basically developing recommendations currently for the update of the DPG standard. And one part is really the technical components, and here we build on the open source definition um, in its current version, so version 00.8. Um, so everything that is marked green here comes directly from OSI's current definition. The other technical components that are here as well, specifically under the Anchorage components, they come from the Linux Foundation's model openness framework. So we really uh, take these two sources to define what is actually needed to determine if a product is open source uh, AI and also therefore the foundation for open source digital public goods. So I don't want to run through all of this. I mean, you can look up what the current definition uh, or the draft definition of the open source initiative is for open source AI, but I want to dwell maybe on two or three things uh, just quickly. And one is the data part, because that is of course the most contested part when it comes to the open source definition. And from our perspective, open data, open training data, open testing data is desirable, but not conditional. And that is for several reasons. First of all, open data, of course, it doesn't equal source code, so you can't make this comparison. But the reproducibility of a model is actually also something that we are not too much interested in, uh, to be honest. And that is for the reason that it's, first of all, very expensive uh, to reproduce a model. But then also reproducibility is not an audit. And we are interested, of course, in auditing systems. So we need other means uh, to look into a system. And as I said, openness for us and open source for us is a means to an end. So we really want to give people the ability to develop local solutions for local ambitions, um, which means to impact livelihoods positively at the end of the day. And for this reason, we are actually quite happy with the current version of the draft uh, of the open source AI definition because this leather standard basically helps us, first of all, navigate legal insecurities around data sharing. So that's one reason. But for us, the more important reason is also it just widens the pool of possible solutions that can be recognized and marketed and made available as digital public goods, and therefore giving more opportunities to impact people's lives in a positive, in a positive way. And yeah, that's, that's basically the main reason of why we think the current definition of open source AI is actually quite, uh, quite good. But it doesn't mean that we are not <laughs> for openness, of course. As I said, it's desirable, but it's an ideal, and we come more from a pragmatic uh, viewpoint. And the other thing I wanted to quickly uh, dwell on really is the aspect of responsibility. So um, how do we bake this in? And we have as a DPG, Standard, there are two indicators in it that look at uh, adherence to applicable laws, but also at adherence to uh, privacy and uh, risk mitigation for some other aspects as well. And what we require basically from uh, developers are, well, two or three things there. And you will see it's quite general, but that's, that's also for a reason. The first thing is an estimation of a CO2 footprint, so that goes in the sustainability direction, and that's quite new, uh, also for the DPG standard. And the other thing is responsible AI documentation. And we, when we talk about responsible AI, we refer to the UNESCO definition of ethical and responsible AI. So a developer must provide evidence that the model 
was tested for bias and fairness, that the, for security and resilience, transparency and accountability, and a few other aspects, um, and that as, um, measures were taken to mitigate those aspects, right? So we need this kind of evidence. What we don't do is to be prescriptive in the sense of saying, okay, you need to use this tool or that framework in order to prove your point. And that is for the reason that there's currently no industry standard. And what we've di done also with other products is that we want to see what developers submit and based on these initial submissions then make a list of recommended tools and uh, frameworks that can be used by developers to actually prove this point. But we don't want to be the organization that is setting a standard in terms of tools and frameworks before knowing what the industry actually uses and also because we don't want to place a too high burden on developers. So we really want to see what is actually applicable and feasible uh, in these contexts. And yeah, apart from that, of course, um, there are other encouraged parts as well. One thing that we are also considering in a mid to long term perspective is to develop actually templates for risk assessments and for responsible use guidelines. But of course, it's, it's a whole other project in addition to defining uh, and uh, further developing the DBG indicators. And just quickly, what we need uh, when we want to go forward, it's a few things. One are quite concrete, so like standard tools for responsible AI governance. As I said, there's a plethora of things out there. It would be really good to have industry standards for audits, for risk and impact assessments. We also need benchmarks for documentation, especially for the data part, if you say we don't need open data. So we want to understand what is good enough documentation actually. Uh, to serve the point uh, of the OSI definition, right? Um, so that's, that's a need there. Um, we also want to pilot the draft recommendations and map out open questions. So for instance, how do we, how do we deal with fine-tuned models there uh, in terms of documentation? Um, and then on a more meta level, I would say, I think in general for the whole debate around open source, AI and proprietary or more closed solutions. We need a more nuanced understanding of AI risk, so more research in that field, and also generally to accelerate AI safety research to increase robustness of systems. And that basically pertains both open source and proprietary systems as well. And lastly, of course, a consensus on the open source AI definition would be great to have, and for us, it's the sooner the better. So that's from a more theoretical perspective, and now I'm gonna hand it over to Daniel, who will make all of this a bit more tangible. Thank you, Leah, and hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, let's move from the intricacies of uh, defining what open source AI is and uh, what it is as a digital public good to looking at it in more practice. Um, that being said, that of course, the question of how to define open source and AI and what constitutes it is still very much open also in our work. My name is Daniel. I work for a project called Fair Forward that you see up there uh, as part of GIZ, which is the German Agency for International Cooperation. And um, maybe just to give you a brief, um, let me actually check if this thing works. It does, great. Um, so briefly what we do is um, we work in seven partner countries, uh, five in Africa and two in Asia, on uh, creating more, on, or promoting more open, more inclusive and more sustainable AI. And our yeah, main, main purpose mainly is to, to democratize it by open sourcing it so that uh, developers in countries like Kenya, Rwanda, South Africa, or India or and Indonesia have tools to build local innovations uh, with AI that can help improve, for example, public service delivery or, or other tools. And we do that by uh, improving access to training data, skills development, and also supporting countries with policies around ethical use of AI. Um, I wanted to share with you, before going into two project examples that we, that we did, uh, just some of the principles that we are working with, um, or that we've sort of developed together also with partners to see, you know, how do we actually decide which activity to do and what, is, what can be beneficial uh, when, we, when we want to look at open sourcing AI for more fair and also for equitable use. And I'm not going to go through all, how many are there, all seven of them, but I just wanted to point out two, one being, uh, 
which one is it? This one down here, empowering local eco AI ecosystems, which is basically to say that uh, we're not interested in building the next or supporting the next startup in AI from Africa, but to rather build the conditions and the foundations that a uh, whole ecosystem of actors from academia, to, from academia to industry to the public sector can use to build AI tools that are beneficial to citizens. And then the other aspect I wanted to quickly point out is that there should be a clear value add by leveraging AI, so not AI for the purpose of building LLMs or for the purpose of building AI, but AI for the purpose of um, helping citizens uh, access service services in their own language, for example, more easily. Um, another point I wanted to quickly point out is this slightly crazy looking cycle, and again, I'm not gonna go through everything, but it's something that we actually developed quite at the start of Fair Forward, and it still holds um, remarkably, like it, it still works. We re-looked at, re at it the other day. Just to say that, you know, when we started uh, in 2019, 18, 19, uh, it was, we were very much looking at, um, you know, how do we, what data sets could we, uh, would, would add the most benefit, for example. So there was an early focus on language data, and then we um, worked with uh, global actors like Mozilla, the Mozilla Foundation, on creating data sets and languages in Africa, and then go through the cycle to you know, look at, okay, first, once we build the data, then how do we, where and how can we release it, under what uh, licensing, which is a question that I'll get to in a minute, uh, build the models, for example, for speech recognitions um, or, or spe speech synthesis, and then feed those models into or, or, or um, work with organizations, for example, in Kenya, South Africa, or Ghana, who then use these models to build services, to build products, and support them with uh, building business models around that, how to actually uh, sustain those um, those applications. And I will present two just now, just to say that now after about five years uh, of, of the project running time, we've now also come, we're in the second round of a program to work with organizations who have products, who have services, and who are working on, on business models and grappling their minds around question of what is open source AI, what license should be used, uh, what should we make open, what should remain sort of closed so that we can also, uh, or that they rather, I should say, um, can also have, uh, have a business around that. All that being said, um, let me take you to Rwanda, which is actually actually where um, Lea and myself in 2018, I think, uh, started a small activity with Mozilla, the Mozilla Foundation, and the Common Voice project on collecting speech data. Uh, the context for that is that uh, if you look at, uh, for those of you who were at the keynote this morning on the Common Corpus, I think it was called, I was confused with the Common Crawl, uh, I believe 70 to 80% of that is English, and then there's a few other languages. Uh, African languages are virtually non-present. And I think today that's still um, quite, quite very much the case. So the question was, how can we build the uh, foundational data sets so that speech uh, recognition technology can be usable in languages that are non-European, in languages that are called low-resourced, low-resourced for the fact because there's not a lot of digital resources available for those languages. So we, uh, yeah, ended up building a cooperation to, with the, sorry, pressed the wrong button. This is the one that I wanted. We cooperated with Mozilla Common Voice and then started cooperating with, um, with a group of uh, actors in Rwanda to, to crowdsourcing a language data set in the national language that is, co that is called Kenya Rwanda. Um, and um, we then went on to, uh, we actually, we, it started with a hackathon uh, out of which a company called Digital Umuganda um, got created, uh, which then um, ran a whole crowdsourcing effort with university networks, with students, and with a growing network of co contributors also from, the pu from public institutions to first build a data set and then use Common Voice uh, to also build the corresponding voice data um, through which then uh, models could be created for both, um, well, common voices mainly for speech recognition, um, but currently they're also working on speech synthesis for the, um, for example. And um, 
through that community work, which took quite a fair amount of time, a community called Mbaza. Mbaza community was, uh, was created, which is still running, which is like a national open source network that is both there to improve existing models that they have, but also allow uh, up and coming um, NLP researchers, for example, students and others to uh, build the skills that they need to use these resources for their own services. Um, yeah, <laughs> let me move to the next one. Um, then taking you to Kenya, uh, a different context. Um, there we work with an organization called the Local Development Research Initiative, or short LDRI, that is an agricultural think tank, um, building solutions to uh, support efforts to end poverty, to support with food security, and, and reduce inequalities. Um, for context, in Kenya, smallholder farming, so you really, small farms, uh, make up about 80% of agricultural output. And they are very susceptible, so those smallholder farmers, many of which are women, are very susceptible to the effects of climate change, droughts, flooding, and how to adapt their farming practices to that, both in terms of the crop types that they plant, but also the um, pesticides and other practices that they use to uh, make sure that their uh, crops survive and yield enough produce. So we uh, teamed up with the LDRI to um, build data sets that we called hyperlocal because they're a combination of satellite data uh, of, of a, sp a specific region in Kenya that is then um, enriched with images, crop images, but also land boundaries. Um, all of that is done in a very community grounded way with uh, 800 farms that are participating and just to get the number right, 40 village-based advisors. Village-based advisors are people that are based in the different communities who work with farmers to get data on crop conditions, on um, soil conditions, and different aspects, which all are used to enrich the data sets uh, that have then been used to build um, local, uh, locally contextually informed models for crop, um, crop identification and crop yield prediction. And um, the, the aim of this work is to build an early warning system that can support farmers in Kenya with uh, current up-to-date information on, um, um, on, for example, crop yields that they can estimate, that, 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 that they can expect, but also information on farming practices in terms of how they might want to adjust their uh, practices to adjust um, in terms of when, when there's a drought for example, that, that, could be, uh, that could be coming up. Um, one aspect that I wanted to point out here is, which is quite interesting, with LDRI, we've been working for about three years, I believe, and we are currently at a point where we are also working with them on a business model for the organization, so they're non-profit mainly, um, but they are, we're looking at you know, which parts of the data that they've been developed together with the communities can they make open, a large part of it, but what part can they also, what fine-tune, for example, models can they also remain, um, keep closed to build premium services so that they can both, as a company, if you um, remember the cycle that I showed, can both um, contribute to open data sets that others in the ecosystem can also use, whilst also um, employing premium services uh, that allow them to also make and create some revenue to sustain themselves as an organization, as an institution. To summarize, and I'm sure I'm horribly over time, um, so open source in Africa, and uh, yeah, I just want to make sure and say that I by no means like um, want to come across as speaking for uh, our African partners. These are just things that I've learned um, and that have been that have come up in discussions with uh, partners like LDRI, Digital Uganda, and others. Uh, open source in Africa, open source AI in Africa, does not necessarily mean the same as it does here. Uh, there's benefits, there's helpful aspects, but there's also sort of limitations. And um, here you see just a few that I wanted to point out. One is that in terms of where open source AI can be helpful is of course in accessibility, accessibility of data in domains and sectors where such data did not yet exist, at least not publicly available. For example, speech data in Kenya, Rwanda, the national language in Rwanda, or in Kiswahili, which is spoken in Kenya, Tanzania, and the DRC. And those data sets are important building blocks for innovation in those countries that then developers, even public institutions, can utilize to improve uh, products and services. Uh, it's not a silver bullet, it's not a panacea, uh, it's not going to solve everything, uh, even though like 
some of the hype around LLMs and generative AI may sound like uh, the new silver bullet, uh, it is definitely not. And two points I wanted to leave you with is first, there's a fine line between open sourcing uh, AI models and data and uh, ensuring that there's equitable benef benefit out of that data that is, uh, that is made openly available. What I mean by that is, um, is to give you an example from uh, the work that we did with uh, Common Voice on language data, uh, working with communities like the one in Rwanda, a lot of the volunteers who, pro who provided their speech data for free, voluntarily, were quite interested in doing something positive for the country, for their language. Um, now, nah, but if they make it, and no, but but and if they make all of that fully openly available, the question is, what benefit do they get out of it? What benefit do developers in Rwanda get out of it? Uh, if they maybe lack skills or uh, access to compute to build to build models, so this this is a question of licensing. It's a question not around data governance. It doesn't mean closing everything, but it also means maybe looking for appropriate open source licensing models, which is work that we are currently uh, starting to do with the Mozilla Foundation and partners in Kenya. And then the second asp aspect is around opportunities for upskilling and access to compute. Uh, there is a growing AI developer scene in Kenya and South Africa and Rwanda and elsewhere, um, but there's still need for more expertise and there's need for access to compute. That comes up time and again and compute that does not make developers dependent only on your AWS and your US-based companies, but also compute that allows them to be independent from the big tech players. And with that, I think I am done. So yeah, thank you. I think we do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I know we're standing between lunch, uh, between you and lunch, but if you still have questions, yeah, please let us know. I can, I can barely see you, so, because the light is quite bright, but if you have a, I can see a hand over there, yes. Um, for our work with the phone, yes, I mean, there's a lot going on in the different uh, um, countries that we're working in. And, and sorry, I'll, I'll try to see you, but I really, I, I just can't. <laughs> um, we are, like I said, we're working with Mozilla and partners in Kenya around the question of like data licensing and governance. Uh, we work a lot, the colleagues of mine work also a lot in India and Indonesia on creating data sets in different domains, language data, but also um, later uh, data, um, uh, data, that, for example, that can be used for der um, to map deforestation and other aspects. So all of that is ongoing and I'm happy to uh, give you some more information and also send you some links where you can read up on more information. Yeah, and for us it's about increasing the number of AI DPGs on the DPG registry. So we currently have 160, around 160 products there. Most of them are open source uh, solutions, uh, open source software solutions. So what we are planning is to run a discoverability campaign for AI DPG, so open source AI uh, in the climate uh, sector. So uh, any solutions that help to mitigate or adapt to climate change basically, and that's stuff that we are currently preparing with a number of uh, partner organizations such as UNFCCC for instance. So if you work on any of these uh, things, uh, let us know. Uh, generally for climate, um, but also in other areas, we are always happy to onboard new products uh, to the DPG registry if they fit our standard. There's another question. Okay, so the question was around replication and, uh, well, I mean, that's what the open sourcing bit is for. Uh, everything is published on partly on GitHub. Um, when it comes to the software, the models, some of the models are published on Hugging Face, if I'm not mistaken, and the data sets, well, that's a little bit of a challenge. They are published in different places, but they're all accessible. Uh, we work also, for example, with an organization called Meridian that runs the Lacuna Fund that creates open data sets in, for NLP, which is natural, natural language processing, but also agriculture and climate. Their data sets that they've um, supported and funded 
excuse me, are, all, are also all openly available. So people elsewhere, developers elsewhere, Africa or elsewhere can, can utilize those. Yeah, and I will say that data obviously is one of the core challenges. Um, I mean, you can take a trained model and fine tune it, but you need the data obviously that is relevant to the specific context. And what the project did is to collect data in specific context, but if you want to transfer it to another country, for instance, you need to have this country specific data, of course. So if we talk about um, increasing the number of relevant open source AI solutions for global majority countries, we not only look at models, we not only look at the compute divide, we also look at the data divide, of course. So we need to address the whole AI stack, basically, and uh, yeah, tackle all of these layers to yeah, close the gap and make more relevant solutions and development resources really available. Uh, so data is a core part and core challenge uh, here. That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> so when we look at uh, governance of digital public goods, we mainly focus on the uh, research literature that's out there on open source communities, uh, uh, to be honest. Um, but also looking at um, well other non-digital goods and the commons in general, I mean, we observe a few things that are really, I mean, that can become stumbling blocks, really. One is of course, a free rider problem that we see in a lot of these projects. And I mean, specifically, of course, in open source software, so software DPGs, if you want. Um, so we have solutions on registries that are quite big, that serve over 80 countries worldwide, around 30% of, of the population. But they face, for instance, a challenge that other commercial actors, uh, well, build on top of their product, but also replicate some of the features, diverting funding from an open solution to a closed solution. So the free rider problem and how to ensure that people give back to the community, how to establish governance structures around this, that's one core part. And the other thing is, of course, I mean, if you speak about creating public value as a shared interest of several ecosystem actors, you also need to guide people towards this shared interest. And if someone is engaging in a community, they also always come with personal interests. So it's a... It's a balance, basically, between opening up contributions and making sure that there is equitable access to being able to develop or you know, bring in your own requested of stuff that needs to be developed, while at the same time ensuring that you're actually working to or towards a common good and not only serving individual interests. And that, for instance, means for many of the products to try to be more generalizable. So to have a core product that is more of a building block and others can take it and localize it. Um, but it's always a balance between how to, de how to govern the community around this as a maintainer, for instance. So that comes to mind. And there was another question here, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's another good <laughs> question, really. Um, I mean, we help products develop business models. We, for instance, uh, GitHub is a member of the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Uh, we um, do community support work uh, with the support of GitHub. Um, so, and this includes develop sustainable business models, but I think many of these products are also developed through funding of donor organizations, so bilateral or multilateral organizations. And here, really, we need to rethink, I think, the narrative, how these things are funded. Um, so usually what you have is catalytic funding. So, you know, you uh, expect a certain outcome and have a certain endpoint in mind. And uh, until then, the funding is running, but then it's cut off at a certain point. But especially if you think more about an infrastructure approach uh, to these topics, we need a different understanding of funding because infrastructure funding requires long term funding and not catalytic funding and that's usually not how donors fund things like this so the whole infrastructure debate also linked to the digital public infrastructure public digital infrastructure like choose yourself how you want to call it i mean that also requires not only different terms 
it also requires different funding structures, and that's something we try to rally for, basically. Maybe you can go first and I yeah. build on top. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, again, I'm trying to think, yeah, I think what Leah just mentioned about long-term funding for maintenance, that is a challenge. So if you know anyone who's, who you know, doesn't do the funding the way that your typical donor does, but also looks at funding in the, lo in the longer, medium or longer term, that's definitely a challenge. Another challenge is what I mentioned earlier, access to compute. Uh, a lot of the startups, organizations we work with use you know, big tech compute, which is fine to build the models. And I think it's also what mostly exists at the moment that is easy, easily accessible. But all of, oh, not all of them, but a few of them that we've spoken with also raise concerns about dependency on those players. So um, looking at regional options for compute and, and, and building those centers. And I know that is a very expensive uh, investment. I think that is a challenge. I'm trying to think what else. Um, maybe you have something. <laughs> yeah, I think from a DPG perspective, it's of course a developed community. So many of the products have small communities, which is also sometimes fine. Um, but uh, for many of the products, we also need more developers actually working uh, yeah, on those products uh, to, to maintain them and to make them better over time. And of course, I mean, there are lots of orphaned open source projects. And uh, of course, we don't want that this happens to DPGs. That's, that's one aspect. And then, I mean, looking at AI systems more specifically, what Daniel already said about market concentration, that's definitely up our alley as well. Um, so uh, just because we think if we help, well, if we entrench existing market imbalances, this will in the mid to long term disadvantage the groups we actually want to empower. So to go fast, yes, access to computers is super important. And AWS is, for instance, one of the big ones and alongside the others. And it's fine to also use this compute, but at the other hand, we are also interested in other models to, for instance, uh, give accessibility compute, so decentralized models, for instance. And that is something that's much uh, slower, um, but it's in our view, it's more sustainable. So we try to go both ways. And for all of this, of course, we need cooperation partners to go as fast as we can. So last question, and then I think we are up for lunch all. <laughs> another very good question was about the geopolitical dimension of it all <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, I had a good conversation yesterday with someone who had the vision to build an open source um, consortium basically that on a global level advocates for open source AI and probably other, other open source solutions. But I think it's really hard to disentangle this from geopolitics. I mean, it's, it's an, again an ideal, but if you look at the realities, that's really hard. Um, so, I mean, we, I mean, this is a UN, I mean, the Digital Public Goods Alliance was conceived to the United Nations. So that's also, they are also the main cooperation partners. And we use the GDC, for instance, to, um, well, to advocate, first of all, for digital public goods as such, but also specifically for open source AI, for instance. And here I see, for instance, not so much take up. Um, I think the DPG term in a digital public infrastructure context, that is kind of, uh, canonical, so it, it comes with it, but when it comes to open source AI, there are many more concerns from nation states. And um, I think some parts is that policymakers are not necessarily extremely knowledgeable about all of this. So especially the risk dimensions, risks of open source versus risk of proprietary solutions. And then there is, of course, always a national interest behind it as well when it comes to competition and building up your own ecosystem. 
And I mean, for us, it's really hard to navigate. We try to stay on top of that, basically. So no, we don't want to sit between all the chairs. Um, but as an alliance, for instance, we have principles of non-engagement. So uh, countries can become members of the Public Goods Alliance, and they are also the first target group, basically. Um, but we have these principles to make sure that we uphold democratic values, for instance, and values of transparency within our membership. And that's at least a little, you know, uh, a little starting point uh, to make sure that, well, our work is value-led and that we also have tools in our hands to mitigate any, you know, upcoming potential members that say, okay, the DPGA is a good thing, we want to become part, but at the end, they actually don't contribute to the vision of the organization. So that's maybe for, for a starting point. But I'm happy to hear any other ideas, of course. So how can we take ge geopolitical uh, aspects out of this whole conversation? I'm really keen to discuss this. <laughs> I know over time I would have two two small additions to that, maybe also from our work. <coughs> um, we, like I said, we work also with governments on supporting them with AI policies, and uh, for example in Kenya and South Africa, and there we of course also see geopolitical interests. I mean ourselves, like GIZ, we are we are German, Europeans, so of course there's also interests there, but also other other being interested and in being involved in the process, and I think one lesson there is to make sure that we create and that we have the space for the national governments and also for the you know the, the, the national ecosystem uh, to first figure out what they would like for the policy to do and then um, say okay and, and then figure out okay where do for example big tech companies from the United States or from elsewhere plug in what what what, what can they support um, with regards to policy and then the implementation of the policy. And the other example that I, I wanted to give is that we are actually in a sort of informal coalition with different funders who are all working uh, towards supporting AI development, AI in, in Africa. And the purpose being ourselves, GIZ, but then also from the United States, from the UK, from Canada and, and others, uh, and the purpose there is to really see what do we support, how do we do it, how do we avoid that we support repetitive things, but and also make sure that whatever we support is not driven by our agendas, but is driven by what's actually required, needed, and asked for from partners who work in Africa and South Africa, Ghana, Uganda, and, and well, basically all around Africa. So we support and elevate the work that they would like to do as opposed to us driving the agenda. Just one quick addition to the policy work. We do a lot of advocacy as well around open source AI. So, for instance, we wrote policy briefs for the T20 and uh, T7. Uh, the GDC we already mentioned. So if any of you is working on advocacy work for open source AI as well, I mean, we have a coalition, but uh, there's always space for other organizations as well. So come talk to us. Thanks. And now lunchtime. <laughs>